If you're a Met fan like me, you probably think about the year 2015 a lot. And it kind of feels like it didn't even happen nowadays. It seems like a distant memory. I mean, if I remember the team correctly, we didn't really overpower anybody. We just had a lot of good young players and we rode a lot of hot hands to get to the playoffs and we just kept winning. And when I think about it, a lot of Mets postseason runs, especially the ones that go deep to the World Series, are similar to that narrative. There's a certain magic to these teams that really can't be structured or created by an organization. It just kind of happens throughout the season. And when I thought about that, I thought about the other World Series runs the Mets have had and it brought me back to the year 2000. If I'm being honest, before I did the research for this video, Video, I didn't know much about the 2000 Mets, but what I found was pretty amazing. It might be a bit cliche to use the term team of destiny when talking about the Millennium Mets, but I truly believe there's no real other way to describe them. The Mets were a losing team from 1991 to 1996, had a couple winning seasons in 97 and 98, and finally a wildcard berth that ended in the NLCS in 99, but their biggest step forward would be in 2000, where they rode their wildcard berth all the way to the World Series, and that's the season we're going to be talking about today. Now, teams that make the World Series are usually dominant in their own regard, but the Millennium Mets weren't really a titan to be feared in the league. They performed well and had great players like Benny Agbayani, Mike Piazza, Al Leiter, Edgardo Alfonso, Mike Hampton, but something about the team always screamed underdog. This was encapsulated by the fact that the Mets during this 2000 season made 45 comeback victories. So they really just had the heart of a champion, not so much the talent of a champion. Before we dive into the two amazing games as detailed by the title of the video, I wanted to look at the team stats for the Mets over the course of this 2000 season and see where they fell. As you can see from this graphic here, the Mets were very much in the middle of the pack when it came to 2000 National League offensive teams, ranking sixth in most of the primary categories. Their strength mainly resided in their team pitching, bouncing off the guys like Mike Hampton, Al Leiter, and a certain Bobby Jones that we'll talk about more later. But before we talk any more about how they performed on the whole season, I want to take you to one regular season game specifically that took place on June 30th. At this point, the Mets are second in the NL East, four games behind the team that they're playing, the Atlanta Braves. The Braves are up 8-1 in the eighth inning, and this game looks all but wrapped up. The Mets have been shut down by Kevin Millwood, but they need every game they can get. They're going to need a miracle rally, and the man tasked to start it off is Derek Bell. He takes ball one there, and can we just appreciate this really good mustache? I mean, my god, best stash on the Mets for sure. He's going to single up the middle there, and Andrew Jones is just going to jog on real casually because they're up 8-1, to one, nothing to worry about. Up steps Edgardo Alfonso, nice little licking of the lips right there. He's ready to get a pitch he can swing at. He hammers that one to right center. Jones is like, okay, I'm going to run this time because I need to catch that. But there's one out. Okay. So this will bring up Mike Piazza, the pizza man himself. He's betting 364 on the year up until this point. He grounds that one up the middle. It's booted by a very young Rafael Fercal, and then he makes the key mistake of two errors in one play if you boot the ball make sure you don't boot the throw he booted the throw and he's gonna blow a nice bubble here look at that action ah the days of the mets having a good catcher robin ventura is gonna come up next he's gonna ground out here they'll concede the run so it's eight to two so the mets are now down six but they only have one out left in the inning before they head to the ninth in a deficit todd zeal the first baseman comes up next he takes inside there and then he's going to rope this pitch from Wengert for a base hit. That's going to bring home a run. That'll make it 8-3. to three. Puts the runner on first. The rally remains alive. And now the Braves coach is like, God, mm. got to wipe the hair off his face, except he's bald. So maybe let out a little fart there. I don't know what that was, a little shimmy. He's upset. He can't believe it. They're still up five. So I, I feel like the anger is a little bit out of reason. But based on what comes next, I guess he kind of saw it coming a little bit. Wengert finds the strike zone there. That one slashed foul. Jay Payton's going to straighten it out, though. Dunk that into right center just in the middle there. And another base runner for the Mets. Brian Jordan's going to field this one. Boom. Now he's rocking. Check out the rocking action on the right there. They're going to take Wingard out, which they should have done a while ago. Two men are on for Mr. Clout himself, Benny Agbayani, the king, the goat. Kerry Leitenberg comes in for the Braves, and this is truly where the inning goes from bad to worse because of all the goddamn balls. He swings through that one, a home run cut right there. Misses again in the dirt, runners don't move, and then Leitenberg's gonna walk him there. Agbayani, he's gonna think about the bad flip. He's like, nah, I'll be respectful. We're not, we're not doing it just yet. 
Just wait. Bobby Cox looks pissed because he always looks pissed. And that's just his main face there. That's just how he rolls. Pinch hitter Mark Johnson steps up. He takes ball one there. Then on the exact same pitch, he gets called for a strike. Thanks, Blue. Thanks a lot. Takes a winner's cut there. So Leitenberg gets his first two strike count of the night. Hey, maybe things will turn around. Maybe we'll get out of this. Doesn't bite on the fastball there. Then he's going to throw him one more cut. And no thank you. He checks his swing again. No call again for Leitenberg. Leitenberg walks in the run. That's going to make it eight to four. God damn it. He might have not sounded that peppy, but I wasn't there. You weren't there. How are we supposed to know? Let's just go with my guess, right? Or he's like, hey, man, you told me you were going to throw strike and that's why I put you in. But he throws another ball. Up at bat is Melvin Moore, a future Oriole. He takes the strike there. It's one and one, but that's high. Catcher's like, fuck, man, we're done. He just flicks the ball back. He knows what's coming. Takes that right down the middle. Another two strike count for Lightenberg. Can he put it away that time? Low. Now more at bat flips because he's like, man, did you guys see my walk? That was so sick, guys. And they're like, yeah, I guess. I mean, he, we just got like three of those. Yeah, he's going to get taken out a little bit too late. He comes on, walks three guys, and then leaves. So he does his part to help the cause. Derek Bell started the inning. He's up again. This guy's like, like, should I clap? Should I clap? Yeah, okay. I'll clap. I'll clap. Yeah, I'll clap from the Mets. Sure. He's going to take inside one more time there. No one of the Braves pitchers seemed to be able to find the zone. Cool shot there. And then... Ball four. Another run for the Mets. One of the uh, easier rallies I've seen. Alfonso comes up. He wasn't able to get it done last at bat. He's going to take strike one there. And this at bat is going to be a battle. No easy four pitch walk here. He's down two strikes. They tell us what pitch he's going to throw. Now we can bang a trash can to let him know it's a four seam fastball. Fouls that one away. Big chomps coming in from the Braves coach right there. Big chomps. And then Alfonso's going to dig out the low slider. Grounds that one through the hole. And this is going to tie the game at Eight. The Braves bullpen completely implodes in what must be a must-win game since all games between these teams are going to be must-win throughout the season. The Mets tied up in the eighth and up steps the pizza delivery guy himself. Now, if I'm Mike, I'm thinking, okay, we've seen a lot of balls tonight. Maybe I'll just take a pitch or two, find a pitch I like. Wait, never mind. Fuck it. Let's just swing the first pitch and rock that shit. Oh my god, that thing's a bullet. Mike Piazza has enormous balls. Check out that fist bump. That was nice. If a fan gets hit by that, they're literally dead, but who cares? No one did. We can celebrate. Right. Shea Stadium is literally rocking back and forth in the wind. Here's your win probability after that inning. And this is just the perfect encapsulation of why I showed this game. These were just the comeback kids. They wouldn't overpower you. They wouldn't outstrength you with their pitching, but they would just find ways to win. They would scrap together wins like this with a lot of walks, a lot of good at-bats, and this fueled their momentum towards the rest of the season. The Mets would go on an impressive run in one-run games, improving to nine games over 500 after July 27th, and that proved to be the key difference in them making the postseason as the wildcard team. Even though the Mets were stringing together a bunch of really impressive close wins, their offense didn't change all that much. In fact, you could argue that it probably got worse. They were fifth in OPS in August, which is very respectable, but in September, during crunch time, their OPS fell to 10th in the National League. As for their team pitching, they actually fell from their top three pedestal in the National League. They ranked sixth in ERA in August and seventh in ERA in September. But the team just kept on winning, and they rode their hot hand all the way to the playoffs. Their division series opponent was a team that seemed to outclass them in every way possible, the San Francisco Giants. Led by a menacing pair of Barry Bonds and Jeff Kent, the Giants marched their way to a decisive Game 1 victory led by Levon Hernandez in his early years. Game 2 was more of a tug of war. The Mets put up 2 in the ninth to go up 4-1, to one but this lead would be short-lived as Armando Benitez took the mound in the ninth and gave up three runs, all coming from this dramatic mammoth blast from J.T. Snow. And just like that, we were sent to extras. Jay Payton would nudge the Mets back in front in the 10th with an RBI single, leaving the ball to John Franco for a dramatic dream matchup against Barry Bonds. Franco, the all-time Mets save leader, got the strikeout on a pretty controversial call, but the Mets take game two. Game 3 stays tied 2-2 two two from the 8th to the 13th, when Benny Agbayani steps up and drills one to dead center field, giving the Mets a dramatic walk-off victory and all the momentum they need to give fans the biggest upset of the postseason so far. One more game is all it took. So, that leads us here. This is Bobby Jones. He's the Mets' fifth string starter, and many were clamoring to not even give him a start in the series. He had been really effective for the Mets during a lot of their losing seasons, including an all-star appearance in 97, but this year he has a 5.06 ERA and not a lot of trust from the fan base. He's about to pitch the game of his life. Jones got some early help when Robin Ventura dumped one over the right field wall off Mark Gardner in the first inning, giving the Mets an early 2-0 lead. 
Now, I'm sure Mets fans weren't comfortable with the 2-0 lead for the rest of the game, but little did they know, this would be all the support that Bobby Jones needed. Bobby Jones was lights out through the first four innings of this game. He had thrown 55 pitches and struck out Barry Bonds twice. To start the fifth, though, he gave up this double to Jeff Kent, and a rally was brewing for the San Francisco Giants who were trying to make a comeback in this game. Jones would load the bases on two walks before inducing a pop fly out from the opposing pitcher Mark Gardner, and just like that, the rally was diffused. Little did the Giants know, they had just blown their only opportunity to come back in this game. Jones would actually end up reaching first base on this strikeout in the following inning, and while on the bases, he came home thanks to two doubles, the first by Timo Perez and the second by Edgardo Alfonso. Just like that, the Mets were up 4-0, four innings away from clinching a win over the Giants in the NLDS. So Jones got back to work. Facing Bonds once again in the top of the sixth, he induced a long, deep flyout to left field. Barry Bonds was now 0-3 against Bobby Jones. Much to the dismay of Giants fans, Bobby Jones only seemed to be improving as the game went on. He threw 12 pitches in the 6th, then just 8 in the 7th and 10 in the 8th, putting him at a very easy pitch count to go the entire distance of the game. Bear in mind that this is Bobby Jones' first ever postseason start, and two of the guys in the lineup are this season's MVP and a guy that would win it 7 times in his career. Just some of that Millennium Mets magic, I guess. We're in the bottom of the eighth, and Bobby Jones is stepping up to the plate. So everyone in the stadium, including both teams, knows that he'll be back on for the ninth to try and finish one of the greatest pitched games by a Met in the postseason ever. On his 114th pitch of the night, he gets a ground out from Marvin Bennard on a 2-2 count. There's one out in the ninth. Up steps up Bill Mueller, and he swings first pitch to a similar result. Ground out to second base, two outs. And of course, the fitting end to the game is one more showdown between Jones and the menace himself, Barry Bonds. Much to everyone's shock, Bonds swings first pitch as well, and on pitch number 116, he sees it fly in the air. A moment of realization occurs to him as Bobby Jones has just twirled a one-hitter in the NLDS and sent the Mets to the next round of the postseason. Led by Bobby Jones's magical one-hitter, the Millennium Mets celebrate on the field to the tune of Who Let the Dogs Out? Because it's the year 2000 and shit is kind of weird like that. Next stop was St. Louis, where they beat the Cardinals in five games to advance to the World Series. But after that, their World Series run was short-lived as they lost to five games in turn to the New York Yankees. This video isn't about what happened before or next or in the years afterward. It's just about a couple really magical games. The kind of games you only get when the team is destined to be remembered. Maybe they're not destined to be great, but they're definitely destined to remain in your memory. I'm the Jolly Olive, and thanks for watching this video. If you know of another team that didn't quite win the ring, but had a pretty crazy run, leave a comment below, and maybe I'll make a video about it. I'll see you guys next time.